Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Gents. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This week on the Garden DC podcast, we're joined by Jan Johnson. She is the author of Heaven is a Garden, The Spirit of Stone, and Gardentopia, and her latest book, Floratopia. Welcome, Jan. Hi there. Hey, so how has your winter been? Well, you know, the snow is still on the ground, and I'm getting a little stir crazy, I have to admit. <laughs> The last time we saw each other in person was a little more than a year ago. We both spoke at I Landscape outside yes. of Chicago, and we were lucky that we weren't snowed in at that one. We were really lucky, yes, but that is a wonderful conference. I had no idea. I Landscape I is really a lot of fun, a lot of information. Yeah. Yeah, that was terrific. I know they had to move it to virtual. Uh, for this year's conference, but I assume it'll be back in person next year. That's yeah, I loved, I loved it. I thought the yeah. speaker lineup was incredible, you know, uh, us being part of it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but no, there were so many top line speakers that I sat in on everybody else's talk and they had such great exhibits. So yeah, if you're definitely in the Chicago area, I would make a point of attending iLandscape every year. That That was terrific. Yes, it sure was. So you are um, joining us today from your home in Croton on Hudson, correct? Yes, in the Hudson Valley of New York. So why did you end up there of all places? Well, that's a great question. I grew up in New York City. I'm a kid from the boroughs. Grew up in, in apartments in Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan. And, uh, and right after high school, I left the city. And I ended up in um, working and studying in Africa, Japan, and then Hawaii, and upon, and studied landscape architecture at the University of Hawaii. But eventually I had to go home. You know, that's where family is. And so long story short, when I came back to the city, I just couldn't deal with it. And I ended up moving north to the Hudson Valley. Beautiful area. Beautiful. Yeah, it is a lovely area. Do you do most of your client work in the New York area or? Where? Yeah, most of it. Yes. Yeah, so I'm a, I have a landscape design build firm and I've had it since 1986. And up until about three years ago, we had our own crews, our own trucks, our shop, everything and designed and build. Now what we do is design and project manage just because we're getting older, you know, my husband and I. and. Um, and this is primarily where we work. It's uh, Westchester County and um, Connecticut, Lower Connecticut. But I work. I've done work in Florida, Massachusetts, California. Yeah, I've been doing it quite a while. I, I've been in this profession for forty-five years, in one way or the other. Wow! I would yeah. never have guessed that. So you were saying your childhood in New York City. Were you big on plants then? Oh, yes. So there I was in this little apartment in Queens as a kid, and I tried to grow everything on the windowsill. My mother thought it was hysterical. I was trying to grow corn, you know, corn. Well, nobody told me that you can't grow corn on the windowsill, so of course I tried <laughs> it. And then, um, I, and then they would sell seeds to us elementary school children. And I was entranced with the names of the seeds. You know, they give you this little piece of paper and they said, you know, packets of seeds like four o'clock, morning glory. I, I remember the names, love in a mist, bachelor buttons. And I, and I would ask my mother, what is it? What does it look like? And back then, of course, you know, we, it was hard. We didn't have, they didn't have shelter magazines or gardening magazines. Nobody could tell me what these things look like. And so I would buy the seeds and try to grow everything on the windowsill, which was not was very successful <laughs> but yeah I was always fascinated with uh, with plants always 
And when you moved from the windowsill, where did you grow next? Oh, so then we moved to Brooklyn, which we going up in the world because now we had a fire escape. I had a fire escape, and that's when I really started to grow things. I, I grew tomatoes out of uh, you know tomato sauce cans and um, and just a little bit more of that. But again, back then, way back then, it was there was no such thing as container gardening. There was no such thing as potting mixes. It, you know, so. Um, but I always was fascinated by plants. And the in, I have a great story for you about that. I been, we eventually ended up in Manhattan, which is, you know, New York City. And I went to high school. It was called the High School of Music and Art. You had to take a test to get in there. I was there for art. But I still loved plants. And my science teacher asked me to... Uh, do some kind of experiment for the New York City Science Fair. I did not want to do it, but she pressured me because she I was good in biology. So I finally, she kept pressuring me and pressuring me. So I said, okay, I finally have an idea for an experiment. And she said, what is it? And I said, the effect of sound on the growth of plants. Now, this was in the late 60s. It was unheard of. She broke out hysterical laughing. And she took me into the teacher's lounge and had me repeat to everybody my ridiculous, um, my ridiculous experiment. She said, tell them what, what you're going to do. And I said, the effect of sound on the growth of plants. <laughs> well, speaking of sound, there goes your phone. No, I just turned off. <laughs> just but, yeah, what a shame and, that your listen, teacher was so, uh, yeah, discouraging. It, oh, it was, I was it, you know, it's humiliating, right? And it was the best thing she could have ever done, Kathy, because you know what I, I was really determined now to make, make this a viable experiment, you know, and I got no support, of course, from her, but long story short, I did it with coleus on windowsills because that's a coleus and I used a clock to provide the constant ticking sound next to the plant, just constant 24 hours a day, ticking, ticking, ticking. Tick, tick, tick. And uh, I had I had a control and all. I had someone else do it too. It grew three times as much as the plant without the sound. Wow. And long story short, first prize, New York City Science Fair. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? Yeah, that's fabulous. And, and now I have one more little thing. I hope I'm not talking too much, but mm -mm. Um, okay, so I I explained to the judges, and I was 16 years old at the time, I, that I surmised that it was the, they said that sitar music and violin music make, is the best sound to make the plants grow. This is other scientists in India had done this. And I surmised that the vibration of the sound made the cytoplasm move faster. I, I, I had no idea, but that was what I, my hypothesis. And fast forward Decades later, and I'm reading an article and about birds, and they say that bird song has the same megahertz as violin music. And I went, oh, my goodness. Bird song makes plants grow. Isn't that remarkable? Mm, that is incredible. And it turned out, because at that point, it was like the giant light bulb went off in my head. So I did research and all that. The vibration, the high pitch vibration of birdsong or violin music, but birdsong opens up the stomata on the leaves and they suck in more, um, I guess at that point, carbon dioxide to facilitate extra growth. So, so that's how it works. So the birds and the plants are truly connected. I just, I thought that was the best. I thought that was a great story. Hmm. And I bet we'll find more connections as the decades progress that we hadn't made before. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, we've just scratched the surface of some of that research. Oh, I think so, too. It's, it's kind of like that when they dis discovered that the trees talk to each other underground, all the, mm -hmm. the, root, the root network the internet of roots mm -hmm. and that trees stretch at night 
Oh, I didn't um, know that. Tree yeah. stretch at night? So I was just reading this uh, recent research report that said that um, light pollution has ha is having a big impact on our old growth trees in the cities because they are relying on the light indicators for at nighttime when it goes dark. They stretch their limbs, you know, imperceptibly to us um, and give off the carbon monoxide or you know into the night and right. if they're not allowed to do that then they are always in growth mode so they're never uh, in that shut down and breathe mode like our sleep cycle our REM cycle um so they're, they're stressed. overstressed yeah so that's what that's very concerning to me since I have floodlights uh you know from a garage a college garage across the street and right. passing traffic every minute so I'm like no wonder my huge old, old oaks are suffering so greatly you can yeah. see it right then you can kind of tell that they're stressed mm -hmm, for sure yeah so I uh, wanted to continue on your journey after high school and your first prize in, in yeah. the science fair um, <laughs> so yeah. you uh, began your professional life in Japan in a landscape architecture office and I assume that was after you studied in Hawaii we, well actually it was the other way around oh. I, I actually went to Japan you see this is also very interesting having grown up in the city I in the high, high school that I did art school the when I went to the guidance council, you know, what are you going to do with your life kind of thing? And she, she said to me, well, you like art and you like plants. She said, become a botanical illustrator. And I said to her, oh, I don't know if I want to do that for a living. I said, I was thinking of maybe becoming an architect. Well, at that point, because I was interested in the built environment, you would think that she would have said, oh, become a landscape architect because you like plants, you know. But we, nobody knew that as a profession when I was in college in, in I mean, in high school in New York City. Mm -hmm. She didn't have, knew that was a profession. I certainly didn't. So I followed the architect path and I went to Japan and got a job as an intern in an architecture office. And I had to teach myself Japanese, which was quite crazy, but I, I did a little bit. And but on the weekends, I would visit these Japanese gardens, the famous Japanese gardens in Kyoto, Japan. And I was so absolutely awestruck about it that when I went back to my job, I put the building I was designing underground in the, into the slope. And I started designing the paths and the bridges and the trees. <laughs> and my, my sensei, my Japanese boss at the architecture office, said to me in Japanese, you're not an architect, you're a landscape architect. And I looked it up in my little dictionary there, you know, and it said park architecture. And he sent me off to a landscape architecture office. This is in Osaka, Japan. And I'm young, you know, I'm like 20. And I thought I was the biggest failure in the world. But of course, he was right. I mean, that's how I learned about landscape architecture was in Japan. And, oh, and so from there, I worked there. And then from there, I went to Hawaii and enrolled in the arch landscape architecture program there. That's how that happened. Wow. And such a wonderful mentor as opposed to that high school science teacher. <laughs> right, right. And, and, you know, that's, and that's, Having great teachers or great mentors is, is so critical in certain junctures in your life, I feel. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I see on your resume that you then worked at, at, for a Versailles trained French gardener. Yeah. So, so I finish up uh, in, in university. I, I come back home to New York. You know, I, I was missing family and friends. And living on in Hawaii sounds wonderful, but you do get island fever like you got to get off the rock. You know, it's like, it's the most isolated archipelago in the world and you can feel it, you know? So I wasn't designed for island living. So I come back to New York. I go for jobs now as, in New York City and it was the most depressing thing because it was like in offices. There were no computers back then. It was all just drawing in these dark office rooms. I, I said, I can't do this. I can't do this. This is what I've signed up for. And um, I went up two hours north, Hudson Valley, along the, to a resort hotel 
called Mohonk Mountain House, and it had won the award for the best landscape grounds in America the year before. And so it's very gorgeous. Mohonk, M-O-H-O-N-K. It's amazing. I, I tell everybody to go visit Mohonk. And um, the head of the grounds was this French gardener who had come from working in Versailles. He was trained in France professionally. You know, I worked for him and we grew 20,000 flowers from seeds and and then planted them out in the display gardens of this hotel because mm-hmm. that's what he do. You know, he knew flowers because he had been trained in, in France. So, um, of course, I knew nothing, nothing at all. I just knew how to do pretty pictures and I didn't know anything about horticulture at that point. And, um, yeah, we, I was the one that would take the little seedlings and put them in the, transplant them into the little six packs, you know, because we grew everything from seed. I, I can, I know how to grow plants, flowers from seeds. And, and there's a whole process. Wow. And so they were started in greenhouses on the property. Oh yes. Yeah. I, I, we had them in greenhouses, you know, we had them in, in the, we had them in the six, first we start off, it's a, it's a, I can we first start off with the, the flats, with the seeds, and you actually have to kind of prepare the plant bed, but the plant bed is the, is the soil, the potting soil in the flats. And then we would um, put them on the heating pads in the greenhouse. Cause this is of course in January, February and March, and then, very gently spray them, not too much because you don't want mildew getting in there. And then I, once they got to a certain height, I had to literally transplant these little little hair-like plantlets into the six packs with the dibble and all, and then grow them on. And we had cold frames that we took care of. It was just, it was quite the operation. And then, and then preparing all the plant beds for the flowers. And you could go online and see Mohunk Gardens and, and see they still, they, it's it's kind of like a Victorian kind of setup for the display gardens with the, oh. with the uh, plant beds. Yeah, that was a lot of work, but a lot of great oh, training. Great training. And that, and so, and the funny thing was, I had, because I had studied landscape architecture, you know, they, back then, I can't talk for today at all. But way back, it was more about architecture than it was about than about plants. And so therefore, um, you know, I was kind of like, oh, flowers? Are you kidding me? Flowers? But then once I started to work with the flowers, I realized that they are the true gems of the plant world. I mean, the colors, the fragrance, the forms. I mean, they're, we are so lucky to have flowers in our life, you know? And before it was like, oh, that's your grandmother's thing. That's not really that important. Hmm. Boy, boy, did I change my tune. <laughs> yeah, there's always that debate in gardening versus foliage versus flowers and which is superior and or could be just a matter of taste, which you prefer more. And we'll dive more into your book about flower gardening, Floritopia, in a second. But first, I wanted to talk about your previous books. Oh, yeah. Um, so was your first book, Heaven is a Garden? And how did that come about? Heaven is a Garden, that was my passion project, because at a point about 10 years ago, yeah, about 10 years ago, I said, you know, I've been in this profession for all these decades, I've learned so much, what am I going to do with this? And um, I thought at that time that I should share it. But I decided, okay, I'll, that's what I'll do. And I would wake up at 5 a.m. every morning and write for about two hours before I went off to work. My husband would say to me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm writing a book. And he would roll his eyes like, oh, great. So, you know, But I felt very strongly about it. And that was the one in which I, uh, I, I talk about uh, my understanding of 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 landscaping and and gardening design, and I looked at ancient traditions, and I and I said, let's use the ancient traditions as the starting point for the way we do things. And so I talk about the lure of the sheltered corner, which 
our ancestors really like to be sheltered with a view out and which we love. We love that idea. You know, when you go into a restaurant, you sit in the corner with your backs protected. I looked yeah. at I looked at the high point, how we just naturally gravitate to a high point, just like our ancestors. And so that's the kind of stuff I talked about. I talked about the messages of the trees and I, you know, it was, it was like my passion project. It was the things that were very close to me and what I cared about. And I thought, I really want people to know these, this. And I wasn't thinking in terms of, you know, who publishes it or any of that. I just did it, you know, over the course of several years. And then luckily enough, this wonderful, wonderful uh, publishing house, St. Lynn's Press, um, took it and published it. And I was, I was very grateful to them. And for those listeners who aren't familiar with St. Lynn's Press, they're based uh, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yep. And so a local publisher, but they have small but beautiful garden books um, that are often sold at public gardens or in gift shops. Um, so definitely look out for the, the series of books from St. Lynn's Press. Yes, really a wonderful uh, group of people there. And then your next book, was it with the same publisher? Yes, and, and that one I wasn't planning on. That one kind of came from the publisher himself. He uh, One of the chapters in Heaven is a Garden is called A Rock's Resonance. And I wrote a little bit about rocks and their place in the landscape and why they're so special and some of the, again, the ancient traditions with rocks. And he called me up and he said, you, you like rocks, don't you? And I said, well, I guess so. And he said, well, you wrote a whole chapter about them. I said, yeah, you're right, I did. He says, what, why don't you write a book? And I said, write a book about working with rocks in the, in the landscape? And he said, yeah. I thought to myself, how on earth am I gonna fill up a whole book, you know, about rocks? <laughs> And you know what happened? I, I wrote so much, we had to cut 40, 40 pages of text. That's how much <laughs> I wrote. <laughs> um, so that became the book called the, uh, the Spirit of Stone. And that is all about using rocks in the landscape, whether it's like walls or, or steps or dry streams or rock gardens or, or stone bridges or what, whatever. It's every way to use ro rocks. And uh that, that was a, I, I still give talks about that. Everybody loves that talk. So, yeah, that's a great one. And I have a Facebook page. I should mention that, shouldn't I? I have a mm -hmm. Facebook page for the Spirit of Stone. And that's what it's called, the Spirit of Stone. And every day I post something about rocks. And believe it or not, there's a lot of people who are rock lovers. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And that's such a an integral part of many gardens is, is the backbone in stone. I agree. I totally agree. They, they definitely um, are the, the, uh, they, they make up the garden, frankly, they, and they create, they're the enduring unmovable presence, whereas the, the plants grow and change their dynamic qualities to them, but the rocks add the stability um, to, to a garden. Mm -hmm. And then your third book, Gardentopia. Yes. Yeah, so Gardentopia is published by W.W. Uh, w. Norton, and um, it's doing quite, quite well. And that came out of uh, all the class. I taught for seven years um, at Columbia University. I taught a uh, graduate uh, workshop in uh, landscape design. And at the same time, I also taught a few classes at the New York Botanic Gardens. I like to teach, obviously. That, that's really what I'm, I'm here for is to teach, I think. But uh, invariably, in all those classes that I taught, people would, someone would raise their hand and say, what are the rules? And I would say, well, there are no rules. I mean, you do, and they would say, no, but they wanted rules. And I'd say, well, you have to know about scale. You have to know about proportion. You have to know about the line in the landscape. and that did not make them happy. They wanted rules. So when I was out on landscape job sites doing my work, I would be doing something and I said, oh, well, I could make that a rule. I said, but I didn't like the word rule. So I said a basic, landscape design basics. And I started to put together all these different so tips on garden design. And I put a whole bunch together, made a, 
a PowerPoint out of it for my classes. And they were very popular. And, you know, and they're individual tips. And so I started to make more and more of them. And I thought, well, this is a lot of fun and people really respond to this. So that's when I decided to put it together as a book. And I have 135 garden design, quote, basics. That's what I call it. Um, wow, and it, 35. That's a yeah. Story. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. But, you know, I had done it already with the classes. So it was pretty it was pretty great. And it's like the sweep of the curve or the um, the what is it the law of the three uh, the three depths in a landscape everything's kind of very I make a tip so you can easily digest it it's you could open it to any page and read the tip like the pop of red a pop of red in the garden just like in a painting just makes everything come alive too much red is like overwhelming but a pop of red is, is quite nice things like that. And, and I talk about paving and terraces and sizes and proportion, but I do it in a way that's easily understandable. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, I can do that. Oh, I understand, you know. Yeah, it's very valuable. And and I think that was the probably the last talk I attended that you gave was based on that book. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah at Islands. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Very accessible for the beginning and even experienced gardener. I always try to talk to, to all levels. Because, you know, just like you want to turn people on to, to gardening, right? I mean, it's so exciting, right? When that person grows their first carrot, you know, it's like the most delicious carrot in the world. <laughs> you know, it's the same kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And I think the photos in it are beautiful and oh, it's thank really you. well laid out and so, so easily digestible. You don't have to sit and read it from beginning to end. You could just jump in and grab idea here and there. Um, so on to your new book, Floratopia. So what made you jump from the general garden principles to a book all about flower gardening? Well, I have to be honest with you, I was a little nervous because I am not a horticulturalist. I am not a flower expert. There's all of those people that you know that are, that they know so much, they know every name of every flower. I mean, it's pretty remarkable, I have to say. And so I thought I was like treading on, you know, sacred ground in a, in a sense. But then I thought, you know, I can write about what I know. And it's not necessarily the horticultural aspect of flowers, although I talk about growing flowers, of course. So I say it's 110 flower garden ideas for your yard, patio, or balcony. So it's really flower garden ideas, you know, rather than how to grow snapdragons or something like that. And uh, and so that's that was the uh, that was the organizing principle for the book, flower gardens. Hmm. And I guess the quintessential question. This might be the hardest one of this today's talk. Yes. Why flowers? You okay. touched on it a little before, but what is it about flowers that motivates you? Okay, there's many different answers. So we'll, we'll I'll start with the the one that's kind of a a very topical one, which is our pollinators are in peril, as you well know. And one of the ways to keep our pollinators happy <laughs> and nourished is with flowers. You know, for years, I keep saying plant uh, milkweed for the, for the butterflies and, and, and things like that. And I thought, well, if we can get people to grow more flowers, then we can at least do our bit in helping with the pollinators, right? The bees, the butterflies, the birds, the moths, uh, the hummingbirds. So that's a number one. And I say that in the book, in the introduction, I say, you know, we need more flowers simply for our pollinators. That's number one. Number two, of course, it's, it's flowers make us happy. Flowers elevate us. All these studies that they, they do, they say flowers is the one thing that makes everyone, no matter how old they are, smile. And they say, you know, in these inner city neighborhoods, and I know because I grew up in those neighborhoods, there was no flowers. I mean, you see one flower, it was like a miracle. And I'm thinking, why can't we have flowers? You, you know, it was like, why don't we have color and life and and fragrance in, in our lives? I mean, they're right here. And so I, I'm doing my bit to kind of uplift our, 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 our 
hab habitats, so to speak, whether it's the city or, or the country or the suburbia, we just have to make it more beautiful. Mm -hmm. And there has to be something Jungian, primeval, something um, that connects us to flowers, that, which is essentially what the sex organ of a plant. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and we're human beings, and, and this is a, something producing chlorophyll, and then it turns into a seed pack. Uh, but somehow it has manipulated us, and it's drawing us in to collect it, to to worship it almost, to, to bring it into our homes, to sprinkle it around our home gardens. So I feel like they've flowers have kind of, I don't want to say tricked us or brainwashed. Yes, they have. Yes, they have. Maybe the better word is seduced. Seduced, <laughs> over, there you are. Yeah. So over generation, over generation, over generation, flowers have found, figured out what humans want. And so I think one of those is obviously bright colors you know soft texture and just pure beauty just growing for beauty that's it i mean i mean of course we're all all of us want to help the pollinators but guess what we get the side bonus of hey this is pretty spectacular now people say oh well i only have a balcony i only have a small back terrace you know and so in my book i spent the I have six sections. The first section is all about growing in planters and containers and, and some ideas, you know, on doing that. And I explained your basic filler, thriller, spiller, you know, for people who don't know those techniques. But then I also go into some great combinations that they can use and some great um, potting ideas, you know, plant pots and all and window box inspiration. And um, I'm looking at it right now. You know, and, and, and certain plants that just love to be in planters like um, super bells, calibrecoa, or fan flower. And I talk about that. I said, you want some beautiful flowers for your pots? Here's some great ideas. And I illustrate it. And again, they're in separate tips. So, you know, you have one page of, of, of information. You, you don't have to commit yourself to more than that. And for those listeners who might be true beginning gardeners there's always that initial confusion of annuals and perennials so oh, yeah we'll probably dive into that for just a second and say an annual is a flower plant that lives for one season or one year so and one and then perennial would be something that is expected and we can't guarantee but is expected yeah. in your growing zone to return the next year and maybe for several years after that and some flowers are long-lived perennials and some are short-lived perennials and then there's the biennial so if you want to take that biennial definition oh oh biennials and biennials are the ones the first year they grow it's only foliage but they come back the following year and flower set seed and then they die. Mm -hmm. So it's a two year yeah. process. So it's a two year process. And some of those are some of our most well loved, like Lunaria, money plant. Yeah. Um, hollyhocks, that's another one yeah. that you seed the first year and then you get the bonus the second year. Sweet so William, mm -hmm. Dianthus, Barbutus. Yeah. That takes a little more patience. And then there's tender perennials, and now they're calling them temperennials oh yeah yeah so those are ones that maybe will winter over if it's a mild winter um, yep. depending on your again again uh, your growing zone so for for us in the mid-atlantic what we call an annual could be a perennial south of here um so everything is local right right like i i, I in the book i always differentiated by that you know a warm season perennial but grown as an annual that kind of thing mm -hmm. like lantana uh, lantana for us that's an annual in other places they grow up to be big shrubs in southern climes yeah there's always um with a book you have to obviously gear it to a, a international if not just national audience yeah and that's you know being gardeners is very difficult because if you live in the mediterranean climate of of southern california it's a whole different world. I mean, and I and I explain that in my book that since I live in the Northeast, I'm I'm more comfortable with with those flowers. And and truly, it's the people who live in in the more temperate zones, like like you and I. That's where the book really is hmm. helpful. Do you have, I guess, in each of those categories, particular favorites? Oh yeah, 
you know, that's the hard thing about writing a book about flowers and flower gardenings. I mean, you can go on and on, you know, the people would say, well, why don't you write about this flower? Why don't you write about that? Well, it's hard. You just, you, you know, when, when do you stop? And, and so I, um, I wanted to talk about flowers that were relatively easy. I didn't want to start talking about things that may or may not be um, successful for people. So if that, that might've been my one limiting factor, but say, for example, I have a section on, um, on just on perennials, and I just say choice select perennials because I can't talk about all of them. One of my faves is the uh, golden variegated iris. You know iris, right? You know the, the beautiful blades of iris like Van Gogh would plant with the purple flowers, the iris flowers. But this one has variegated leaves, green and white stripes, in a vertical, because you know how iris grow vertically. So you get this wonderful, very uh, contrasty green and white or, or gold and white, depending which one you buy, leaves. So even if it's not in flower, this iris is a, a standout, just takes your breath away. And they're deer resistant, which is important where I live, because the deer are rampant here. And um, they look beautiful. You, you plant that with something like cat mint, which is um, nepeta for those, which has a, the which is a more prostrate growth, and it's a great combination. And I have photos of that, and I talk about it. So that's one of my faves, and real tough. It comes back every year. And you might say, well, okay, wh wh what are some other ones? Well, one that's really common, and but there's a reason for it is a plant called geranium rosan. You know that one, right? Mm -hmm. So the hardy, the hardy geranium versus that annual red geranium that you would see in planting boxes or window boxes throughout Europe. Exactly, yep. which I do talk about because it is so good in a container. The pelargoniums, those geraniums. Yes, unfortunately, they're both called geranium, which is confusing. But yeah, different Latin names. But geranium roseanne is one of many of those uh, perennial geraniums. But it blooms constantly. It's a constant, constant bloomer. And so you know if you plant that and it comes back every year, you know for sure you're going to have flowers in your garden. And you can mix that with grasses like a, a dwarf fountain grass. And it's a great combination that both of them come back every year. And it, it's just uh, delightful. So it's that kind of you know, things that I suggest. For your own, say, a cutting garden, what would you recommend or what do you grow just for yourself that you enjoy? Well, you know, it's so interesting you say that because I'm so busy creating these beautiful gardens for other people that I come home, you know, and I'm tired. So what I do is I get these big planters. Like I get a, I have a big plastic, a planter that looks like terracotta, but it's not. It's plastic. So it stays out all winter long. And I plant it right, I put it in the plant bed right by my front door so that it's, you know, it's in the, uh, in the shrubbery basically. And then I plant um, a compact cascade geranium. It is um, similar to pelargoniums, you know, but they're cascade ones. So they kind of are more, more um, rangy, which I like. And I put that in that big plant, just several of them. And it goes all summer long, all summer long. I have to say, every time I go through my door, I see it's beautiful. So that's one thing I do. I take big planters and I put them right in the plant beds because I have a small property. But for cut flowers, when I do it for other people, I absolutely include Cosmos. Cosmos are a, a wonderful, easy to grow annual, but they make great cut flowers. You know, they're that daisy-like, happy feeling. And uh, they don't like too much fertilizer. In fact, if it's too much, they'll flop over. And um, that's one, of course. And of course, zinnias. Zinnias, cosmos, oh my goodness. You know, great cut flowers. The kids love them. You know, you make great little posies out of them. And super easy to grow from seed, basically. And both of them, yeah. yeah. You just yeah. throw the seed out and they basically grow themselves. And I think that would be a great thing if people wanted to do something with kids. Uh, those would be the two flowers to start with, I think, you know, with seeds. Yeah, that, those are two great choices. And I love your tip about 
putting containers right by your door where you're coming and going. Um, yeah. That's what I always recommend for beginners too, is you'll something that you're going to interact with and see a lot and enjoy. You don't want to have to go all the way out to say the back 40 to, <laughs> to yeah. um, have your, you know, flower garden back there where you can't enjoy it while you come and go. Exactly. And, and it's easy. It's very easy that way. And then I go into like uh, colors, like I, I, there's certain color combinations that people really enjoy, like silver and purple. One tip is called the best of silver and purple and some pink. And I talk about various sun and shade combinations you could use. And I, I illustrate it all, which is like, because, you know, honestly, when I read a garden book, I, I, I have to admit this. First thing I do is I look at the photos. And if I like the photo, I read the caption. And then I may read the text. But honestly, not so, so often. <laughs> That's me. So I wrote the book that way. So I have really nice photos with very meaty captions, you know, captions that have information in them. And then, oh, yeah, and then you could read the text. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking um, that, you know, that's one of the burdens of garden books, of course, is that you really have to have four color, fo full color fo photography in it because it is such a visual medium. Um, you can't really get away with like a black and white tome but unless it's an essay book about gardens yeah and we are now a visual society we have really because of our whole life is on the screen at this point it's all visual you know instagram what would instagram be without photos right mm -hmm. so we're all going that way we talked a little bit about what a beginning flower gardener could start with and from seed but what about the more advanced? What do you think are some of the harder flowers for us to grow um, on the East Coast in particular? Well, you know, I did talk about, I, I paid homage to uh, Pete Aldoff in the book where I talk about tips from his amazing perennial style, right? And I also mentioned uh, learning from Monet because Monet was, a gr he was as great a gardener as he was uh, a painter, frankly. And, and in, in those cases, sometimes the plants and the plant combinations are a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit more sophisticated, I should say. So in certain cases, I talk about um, plants like Angelica, which I think that's a biennial, isn't that? I think, I can't remember right now. But Angelica gigas, which is a, a great one, or... Mm -hmm. um, the various varieties of echinacea, and there's so many now that uh, people can play with. And when the combination of, say, the echinacea with helenium, which I talk about, and these are, you know, that's a little bit more more advanced, I think, or, or using, um, I have a photo here of uh, the mountain, calamintha, and also, yeah, calamintha, and how you can plant that for the uh, bees. Pycnanthemum, mountain mint. So, yeah, so I talk about all those. Hmm. And I was thinking what of the flowers that I've always had difficulty, and I'm not sure if that's the same way with you, is poppies. Have you ever oh, tried poppies. poppies from seed? Pop, I, I've had trouble with poppies and I've trouble with lupines. I mean. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and Tough for so, us, yeah. Somebody just called me today and said, oh, they want lupines. And I said, well, you know, if you live in Vermont, that's, it's great. And they said, oh, no, there's some here that can do it. But so. I, and, and poppies, you know, it's very unusual. They like hot, dry, gravelly. They don't like it wet. You really have to have the right spot and, and then not pay too much attention. That, that's what I, I think they thrive on neglect, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, the only time I've ever had success with poppies was in an herb garden, which was basically a gravel pit. Yeah. And throwing a wildflower mix in there and they basically came up on their own. So, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But but the one another when you asked me about perennials and one my I love alliums and I I think everybody does at this point. Mm -hmm. You you can't I can't get enough alliums. You get the spring blooming alliums, the summer blooming alliums. And again, they're deer resistant. They come back every year. You can get the white ones and and the purple ones. Uh, I love them. And then of course I also talk about Baptisia and all the various. Uh, 
uh, Baptisia varieties now that are out there and how you can plant them. And of course, Baptisia, once you plant it, though, you'll never be able to move it. So, you know. Yeah, it has that really deep tap root, so it makes it tough to move, but it wants its head in full sun. So definitely, you know, site it where it's not going to get shaded out by a tree. Right. But they come back like clockwork every year and just, just you, you, part of the fun is watching them grow. Don't you think they just grow, 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 and then, then they burst out into their glorious yeah, and I love their seed heads, like little rattles. Yeah, the seed heads too. Yeah, you know, so that and it's a native, of course, and it's a pollinator favorite. So that one, like this one called Baptisia Cherries Jubilee, that I adore. I just love it. See, see, I, I can get. You know, we can talk about all this for for days. <laughs> you know? Yes, and. Uh, it's beginning of March now while we're talking and so a little bit ahead of time for, for most of our either direct sowing or even starting indoor flowers from seed might be starting in the next few weeks. Yep. Um, and then of course you can always visit your local garden center and buy started seedlings and plants in quart size, pint size on up. And do you have any recommendations for those uh, going on their first planting trip of spring, are you going to tell okay. them to fill that cart up or be selective? That's great. That's a great uh, question. Of course, you know that they're going to fill the cart up because people get there and they go crazy. And then they come <laughs> home. I mean, and I guess I should just talk for myself. I, I come home, I have all this stuff, and I don't have any time to plant it because I got to do this, that, and the other things. So now I have moss in there and I start to feel guilty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh mm-hmm. man, I got to water these things. I got to get them in the ground. Or I'm gonna... And so, what I try to tell people is whether if it's just pot, if they're planting in pots or if they're planting in the ground, I say, prepare the plant bed or the pot first do that first before you buy the plants because that'll yeah and and people don't want to hear that they want the sexy stuff first and i say no no do the work first and then go and it'll make your life a lot happier that's number one number two i say like in the book too i say maybe have a theme and i and i have a whole section on themes so that at least if you have a theme it kind of Focus you, you a little bit. So, for example, you could have theme of a color. You could have theme of I, I, you could have a theme of a, a, a fragrance. You could have a theme of butterfly garden. You could have a theme of I, I gave one of Shakespearean garden. You, there's a whole all these different themes, and at least then you can focus. Say, oh no, I'm just doing butterfly plants, or I'm just doing blue and yellow plants, whatever it is. And and again, you know, the other thing too is that when you're buying your vegetables. Get those marigolds to plant with the uh, tomatoes, you know, or or get the uh, white alyssum that helps get all the bad bugs. I talk about that plant a flower highway. I don't know if you saw that one. That um, no, I didn't see that one yet. But yeah, I'll definitely read that section. It, it's about certain flowers can literally attract the um, the good bugs that then. Att- will eat up all the bad bugs, you know, that are already there in your garden. Excellent. So final thoughts on flower gardening. Who should do it? When they should do it? Like as in, as in time of life, as a child, as an adult, as a retiree? Yeah, you can already see where that one's going, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I wish... I, I had a garden when I was a kid, you know, like a real garden, which I didn't. But it's nothing so wonderful as to see the little hand, you know, the little radish seeds that they put into the milk carton and they show you the radishes that they grew and how exciting that is. Well, I, I feel that same way, you know, do it with marigolds, plant some little marigold seeds and watch them as the marigolds start to pop or sunflowers. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is the year of the sunflower, right? Get a whole bunch of different sunflowers, the branched ones, the single stem ones. Get the kids and uh, get them to seed those sunflowers. And it's, it's, it's the most exciting. I, I did it as a kid. And then, and then of course, onward and upward, all the way through the golden years. I, I, don't, I think we all just love to. It's a connection with nature that we crave, and this is an easy way to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's something we will never outgrow. Exactly. Amen. Everybody appreciates being gifted flowers. And of course, 
when you're growing them yourself in the garden, that makes the gift even more special. Absolutely. And just to watch them grow is the gift, you know? Mm -hmm. And as Pete Aldorf has taught us now, it's not just about the bloom. It's all about the, what happens afterwards, the seeds, the seed heads, the birds coming to feed on them. It's, it's the whole life cycle. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again, Jan. How can listeners follow up with you and find you online? Okay, so I, I'm on Instagram, and it's at Johnson Design, all one word, but my last name is Johnson, so it's J-O-H-N-S-E-N, -S -S -E Johnson Design. That's on Instagram. And then on Facebook, and, and I do all this stuff, right? I'm at um, Serenity in the Garden blog. That's one page. And the other page, as you know, is the Spirit of Stone. And they can find me there. And then I also have a website, which I which I am been remiss to do. So it's a little old right now, but and that's called Serenity in the Garden dot com. And they can purchase your book um, from anywhere they buy. Anywhere. Books. Yep. Barnes and Noble and Indiebound, any of your <laughs> local bookstores. And if you do want to get it on Amazon. I, I found that there's a little bit of a glitch when you write the word floratopia in, you got to put the colon right after the last letter and it'll come up. Otherwise, for some reason, it's not coming up. So floratopia colon, you know, the two dots. Yeah? Good to know. Yeah. And we'll put that link also in the podcast notes so people can just oh, click good. over to that as well. Great. Um, thank you again. Oh, uh, thank you. Sitting here on what's you know, a, a early spring, late winter day yearning to be out in the garden and cutting armfuls of cosmos and zinnias to bring inside. Oh, so yeah. Something to look forward to in the growing season. Absolutely. Thanks again, Kathy. Plant Profile Winter Sweet. Fragrant Winter Sweet, or simply Winter Sweet, Chimonanthus, is a pleasantly scented shrub that blooms in midwinter through February. Its delicate flowers emerge along the stems before the foliage unfurls. The blooms are translucent and waxy. Ice and snow don't phase them. Winter Sweet does best in full to part sun. It prefers moist but well draining soils. It is drought tolerant once established. The shrub does not need fertilizing, although it appreciates a bit of shredded leaf mulch around its root zone in the late fall. It puts out multi-stem growth in a rough vase shape from 6 to 12 feet tall and wide. It can get a bit leggy, so a hard pruning to rejuvenate it and remove the old stems is recommended after the bloom cycle is complete. Winter Sweet is originally from China. It does support pollinators and birds will feast on its non-showy fruits. The shrub can take a few years until you see the first blooms. To propagate it, take a soft wood cutting or collect the seeds from these fruits. It may also self-seed. Note that the seedlings are often the straight species, which blooms earlier in the cold season. Winter sweet, you can grow that. What's new this week? Well, in my own garden, primroses are blooming, more crocuses have popped up, but my February gold daffodils did not make their deadline and are still not blooming this first week of March, so we're playing a waiting game there. I've bought more branches in for forcing and blooming, and I have indoor tulips about to bloom as well. So, in the greater gardening world, I attended the press conferences for both the upcoming Cherry Blossom Festival and the Philadelphia Flower Show this week. And for the Cherry Blossom Festival, excited to announce that the Cherry Blossom Peak will be the first week of April this year and something new is being introduced to bring the Cherry Blossom Festival to neighborhoods all around the city and the suburbs. 
and that is the Petal Porches competition. So you can go on now to the official Cherry Blossom website and register your porch or garden or side area, whatever part of your landscape you want to enter and commit to decorating it for the Cherry Blossom Festival period. And I'm going to be blogging a bit about this Um, on the Washington Gardener blog because I have committed (laughs) my gazebo and back garden to be a petal porch location and my theme is centered around pink flamingos so um, look out for more on that on the blog and I'll be sharing photos on the progress of that installation so super excited about that and that we'll have a distanced way of celebrating the National Cherry Blossom Parade um, that we'll be able to explore in our neighborhoods and see some of our local gardens and some fun installations too. For the Philadelphia Flower Show, it's going to be at FDR Park outside of the city center in Philadelphia and of course move to June or I'd be there right now (laughs) as I'm speaking to you because normally it takes place the first week or so of March. I'm really looking forward to this outdoors installation. I can't wait to see some of the exhibits and the themes that were discussed in the press conference. Some of our old favorite displays will be back, like the butterfly experience and the competitions that include um, the photos, the press flowers, the jewelry art made out of um, plant pieces, those more... um, ephemeral and uh, displays like that and competitions will be actually adjacent to the park in uh, the Swiss American Museum. So there will be a bit of an indoor portion, but socially distanced. So at least those um, displays will be protected Um, because I was a bit worried about uh, some of the weather. Even though early June is usually fairly mild for us, it can get hot thunderstorms can roll through and there could be torrential rain. So I am at this point planning on taking a coach bus of readers up to the Philadelphia Flower Show, but I'm still exploring with our coach company what is possible at that point or not. Um, So I'll be hopefully announcing those plans in a few weeks. Um, Some sad news, we had to cancel the seed exchange that we planned on hosting at Green Spring Gardens at the end of March uh, because building capacity is still at just 10 people and that would include staff and volunteers. So that's just not going to work. We couldn't figure out a way around that, but we're still looking into the Brookside Gardens um, seed exchange. That would be the first Saturday of April. So hopefully be able to share more news on that soon. Um, One outdoor event that we are participating in and looking forward to is the Leesburg Flower and Garden Festival the weekend of April 18th. And that is moved from downtown Leesburg to a field outside at the Idlee Park. And there'll be socially distanced, of course, mask mandate, everything like that. And we're planning on having our booth there and maybe a couple surprises for our podcast listeners that weekend. Um, So, again, keep listening for news on that. A few other events uh, have been canceled that we normally participate in in the springtime. Unfortunately, Green Springs Big Plant Sale won't be taking place. And a few other of the big garden festivals that we always participate in um, will not be happening this year. But those that will be happening will be happy to see our readers and listeners at and look forward to seeing you throughout the spring and into the summer. Happy gardening! Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support for as little as 99 cents a month. You can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support garden DC is to go to washingtongardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener magazine.
You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine. Thank you.